Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode eight of the 2022 World War II lecture series brought to you by uh, the Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation and the uh, Philippine American Memorial Endowment, Philwar and Fame. So this is already episode eight. And um, last week, last month, uh, for those of you who watched us, we with Mike Banyos and we discussed war and liberation in Cagayan de Oro. So we really endeavored to uh, include local histories in our webinar because many, many times our focus is on uh, Bataan and Corregidor and the Battle of Manila. But we also have to let the others know about what happened in the other parts of the country as uh, most parts also, you know, um, took on their share of the ordeals of war, no? Marami rin paghihirap. Kumbaga, sa buong bayan natin, there were a lot of hardships. So that's why we endeavored to bring you some local history. So tonight's episode promises to be a very educational and informative session. And we invited top Cebu World War II expert no? to, to discuss the war and resistance in Cebu. So tonight, we dedicate this episode to all our Cebuano friends watching. Sandy, I hope you're watching. Sandy Ebrada. Tito Joe Suarez, uh, he's uh, from Washington, D.C., but his father was a guerrilla in Cebu at that time. No, uh, So he, he woke up very early today to watch. Mark Lauron is also in the U.S., also a Cebuano. So hope you guys are all uh, awake now. Maaga, maagang maaga pa sa Amerika ngayon. <laughs> Thank you all for watching. And we just like to say hi before we start no, our uh, program proper. Hi to um, John Abellera who's watching. Ron Tenilla from Iloilo. Hi, Ron. Uh, Kelly Taylor from Texas. Hi, Kelly. Rich and Delia Foy from Connecticut. So we're all over the world. Tony Ferredo from Pasig City. Hi, Tony. <laughs> Ricky Ornopio Rodoro Agustin. Thank you all for watching. See, Glenn, Glenn Delgo is also watching. So um, thank you so much for uh, choosing to be with us tonight. Alam naman natin na bukas na po lahat ng malls and everything, but thank you for being with us. All right. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. He is the director of the University of San Carlos Museum and head of the NCCA National Committee on Museums. He's also a full professor at the USC or University of San Carlos Department of Anthropology Sociology and History, and Managing Editor of the journal Philippine Quarterly of Culture and Society. He's also co-project leader of the Northern Cebu Archaeological Project. Ah, ah, yung mga post niya talaga nagdidig sila doon, no? On the suburbs of Cebu. He holds a PhD in anthropology with an archaeology, archaeology dissertation from the University of San Carlos on an educational partnership program with the New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, New Mexico, USA. He also holds an MA in Philippine Studies from UP Diliman. Jobbers has written or co-authored a number of heritage books, including the National Book Award finalist, The War in Cebu, and is currently writing on the stamps and postal history of the Philippine colonial period for Vibal Publishing. Woo, that's interesting. So uh, without further ado, uh, we'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, my good friend, Dr. Jose Eliazar Reynes Versales or Jobbers Versales. <laughs> the mic is yours, Jobbers. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction. My gabi, sa lahat. I'd like to thank uh, Desiri Ann Kwa Binipayo, the award-winning author and a good friend of mine. And also the World War II Memorial, uh, Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation for hosting this event and for inviting me to make this presentation. The presentation I will make, <clears throat> excuse me, it actually covers three other presentations that I've made in other occasions and I've combined them together in this, uh, in this, in this, uh, uh, in tonight's uh, discussion. So I hope you will not be bored because this is going to be one long uh, presentation uh, tonight. So the war in Cebu. Um, I will go through 10 uh, sections of this presentation, which is about more or less an hour and a half, or maybe an hour and 15 minutes. I talk very fast, so I hope you will forgive me if, if that is the, the case. <clears throat> So in preparation for the war, 
General MacArthur was recalled, if you remember, by President Manuel Quezon. He requested the United States government, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to send back, uh, to relieve MacArthur, whatever he was doing, and bring him back to the Philippines to start a, a standing army <clears throat> around 1939, 1938. One of those years is the, was the third, 81st Infantry, which was uh, in Cebu at Camp Lapu-Lapu. The original uh, strategy of defense for the Philippines uh, designed by MacArthur was that the Visayas and Mindanao would be combined together under one uh, force no? <clears throat> of uh, a few divisions. This was called the Visayas Mindanao Force. It was to be headed, it was headed in fact, by General William Sharp, whose headquarters was at Fort San Pedro. And Sharp is shown here, very tall, very lanky, together with his uh, driver, General Toriano, or probably General Soriano. Uh, part of the of the force, there was a Cebu Brigade, which was also located, which was uh, uh, at, also at Fort San Pedro, um, headed by Colonel Irving Scudder. And <clears throat> yeah. At the Lahook Airfield, where you find the Camp Lapulapo also in the, in the adjacent to it, was also upgraded uh, for, for warplanes. Here's a photo of the, an aerial photo in, taken in 1936 of the area, no? Banila. And this is where the Lahug Aerodrome or airfield would have been developed. And those are the buildings of Camp Lapulapo. Here is a uh, Cebu Country Club which still exists, the uh, camp, uh, the airfield is now what is called Cebu IT Park, and Camp Lapulapo still exists beyond the, the, the borders of, of the IT Park. And that's our beloved General uh, Bradford uh, Chinoweth, when the Visayas Mindanao Force was divided around the, uh, when the invasion happened, Japanese invasion of the Philippines happened, the Visayas Mindanao Force was split into two. Uh, William Sharp went to Mindanao, brought an end start and, and headed the Mindanao Force, while Chinoweth headed the Visayas Force. He was recalled from Panay and brought to Cebu. Uh, initially, the headquarters, they moved it out of for San Pedro because the Japanese kept on bombing the waterfront and, the, and of course, the fort. So they, they, they had their headquarters at uh, University uh, Colegio de San Carlos campus, the new campus on Imos, which was built only in 1931, and it will be destroyed you now by, by, the, by the bombings later. Um, if you're familiar with Bradford, or if you want to know more about this period of the prelude to the actual Japanese invasion, I will invite you to read General Bradford Genoet's book, Bellamy Park Memoirs. It's a very scathing uh, judgment of General William Sharp. He calls him unprepared for the war, um, a very poor manager who pitted one officer against each other instead of uniting them. Unfortunately, William Sharp never wrote a, a book, so we will never know what he thought of Bradford Chinoweth. But Chinoweth, if you read the book, is a guy who minces no words, and you'd imagine him uh, complaining the whole time no, during the war. He was the one that was tasked with defending the with defending Cebu and on, on, on the eve of war. So you have someone who, who's a no-nonsense guy, keeps on complaining and keeps on muttering uh, things. So uh, we know Pearl Harbor uh, happened around 2 a.m. of December 8, 1942, Philippine time, uh, in the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And then, of course, the, the Bataan, uh, the resistance started, uh, the Japan, uh, Philippine defense was concentrated at Bataan. In this, between this period, the Visayas was never occupied by the Japanese. It was only on when it was announced that uh, General King had surrendered in, in uh, had surrendered Bataan. That was when the United States, the Yusafi forces uh, started demolishing uh, facilities that were not hit by the constant Japanese bombing from December 9, and it's not January 2, to December to April uh, nine, the Japanese kept on bombing, you know, Lahog Airfield and all that, in preparation for their invasion. But it would be repaired and, and, and all that. But 
So on April 9, Charles or Chick, Chick Parsons, the famous MacArthur spy, you know, Colonel Chick Parsons, and uh, General, I like Colonel, I mean, at this time, mining engineer, James Cushing started demolishing uh, bridges and uh, facilitated the, the utilities in, in Cebu. One of those was the Visayas Electric Company uh, diesel power plant, very near the carbon market. And according to, to the report, the winds suddenly blew northwards. So as a result, the entire commercial district of Cebu was burned also at the same time that the, the VECO power plant was burning. So carbon market, the entire Magallanes commercial district, no, which is the which was the business district of, of Cebu at the time, not Colon. No. Colon was full of <clears throat> rice fields at this time. On, on Magallanes was was a more successful commercial street at that time. And so you have this burning. The Japanese eventually invaded Cebu on April 10, the following day. The Kawaguchi uh, detachment, which was sent from um, Borneo to, to uh, reinforce the Japanese positions in Bataan, where it was no longer needed. So they, it was diverted <coughs> excuse me, to Cebu. And uh, we have a Tribune report a newspaper report on the a few uh, April 24, I think, on the actual invasion on April 10, 1942. The following day, April 11, no, as, um, a few days before the Japanese invasion, um, no, no, a few months before uh, Japanese invasion, the uh, high officials of the Philippine Commonwealth were already evacuated out of uh, out of um, Corregidor, where they were holed up after the Manila, Manila was occupied on January 2 by the Japanese. So the government in exile moved to the to, to Banay, to um, Quezon did not want to leave the Philippines, no, but eventually he was prevailed upon by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So they were here in, in, in the Visayas, no, which was relatively untouched by the Japanese. One of those was uh, Justice Jose Abad Santos. The, Great grandfather of of Desiree, who, and this is her book, no, award winning book, uh, which was uh, awarded by the national. It's a national book award, you know. and <clears throat> he was caught here in Cebu uh, because the uh, because the Quezon party left for Mindanao, and uh, Rojas and he were left behind. No, he, Quezon invited him to to join the government and exile in the, in the United States. But uh, Justice Abad Santos, he, he became Chief Justice only around December 24, 1941, uh, a few days after the invasion, the Japanese uh, attacks. Because I think Ramon Avancenia, the Supreme Court Chief Justice, had retired and uh, Quezon saw an opening and he liked this guy. He was, he was a speechwriter. He was very close to him. No, even though his brother was, uh, I think, the founder of the Socialist Party, Pedro Abad Santos. The, 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 the Justice Abad Santos was two-time or three-time Justice uh, Secretary and was also a, with the Supreme Court. He was a favorite of Quezon, but he refused to, to join Quezon. He said that he'd rather stay in the Philippines and stay with his family. And there... And, Quezon appointed him his uh, official de special delegate. No, that effectively made him uh, the uh, pre president, uh, the representative of the president in the in the Philippines. No, while the government went on exile, so he was an important uh, person in the Philippines and a good catch in so far as the Japanese were concerned. He was uh, had crossed over from Negros, whereas they were together with Rojas. Rojas went to to Mindanao to continue. Uh, with the resistance there, the defense there. Um, and while uh, Justice Santos uh, crossed, Abad Santos crossed Cebu. And on the day of the invasion, he tried to go back to Negros via Toledo, but Toledo was, the Japanese had already landed at, at Toledo. So Toledo was already full of Japanese. So he diverted the following day, he went to up north to Barili. I mean, on the south, southwest to Barili, thinking that the Japanese had not landed there. But there was a landing also in Barili 
of the Japanese. So the Japanese were landing uh, days after each other. No? And if I remember, Colonel Valeriano waved at the truck somewhere in Dakit, uh, Barili, thinking that the, the army truck commanded by the Japanese, uh, now Philippine army truck, Yusufi army truck, was, a, was full of soldiers, no? only to realize later that these were Japanese forces. And the car that they drove, they, they rode in, turned around, but it was too late. No? He was arrested, brought to Karkar, investigated. Eventually, we know that he was brought to uh, Malabang in Mindanao, where he was executed for refusing to pledge allegiance to the to the invaders. No? And there's a story, you need to read that very moving story of his patriotism in, in this book, no? honor the legacy of Jose Abad Santos. Now, sadly, there's a marker put up by the, <coughs> excuse me, by the uh, Justice Jose Abad Santos uh, chapter of the Masons. It's a beautiful place. It's, it overlooks a cliff, but it, it says it, it marks the spot where, where Justice Abad Santos was arrested. No, it, it's not the spot. It's about 10 kilometers or maybe seven kilometers away. So it doesn't do justice to Justice Abad Santos' memory that the marker is put at the place where he wasn't even there. No? He was in uh, caught somewhere near the elementary school in Dakit uh, Barili. You know? and, and I think Ian Alfonso, we talked about it and uh, chatted about it on Messenger that a marker should be, and he, he offered a National Historical Commission marker should be put up. So I, I, I'm, we're negotiating with the Barili local government unit to set to request the private owner or maybe the elementary school to set aside a section of the school for a monument or a marker there. <clears throat> Here's a video, I don't know if this will play of the of, of them. Of the Japan the Japanese were very angry when they arrived in Cebu, no? So that's that's the Philippines, Ozon, that's Cebu. And uh, let me force this. And there's no narrator. So these are this is the Kawaguchi detachment. It's moving to, towards Tanyon Strait. Oh, Cebu no Matiwa. So uh, wait, oops, uh, wait, uh, oh. Okay, um, let's move forward to the section where the Japanese start uh, arriving in in uh, Baril in, in Tartoledo. How do I keep this quiet? Okay. Now oh, and uh, so you have these soldiers; they're still very fresh and very young, no? marching. And then the Japanese who were in uh, the concent put in concentration camp at a school, uh, the Basak Elementary School. That school building, by the way, still exists today. They were liberated by the Japanese. There were about 300 to 400 Japanese uh, residents in Cebu. There used to be 800, but 500 apparently already left before the war. So there were about 360 plus who were liberated, including uh, children. Oops. And uh, if you notice when they arrived in the city, you know, so the Japanese commander Kawaguchi talks to them and uh, tells them you are liberated only to realize, and the Japanese civilians later would realize that they, oops, that the whole of uh, Magallanes, the commercial district had already been burned the day before. No? The Japanese were very angry when they saw the commercial district with all the Japanese stores, a vision theater which still exists today. In Kul was all destroyed uh, by the accordingly uh, accidentally when the winds blow. So you have, you have the entire city, the downtown area of the city was gone. The market moved elsewhere, no? and uh, you have a few buildings that survived, but that was it. No? So you have Magallanes, so it's after clearing by the Japanese, but uh, that's that's all you they, they, they could find a shell of of its past. No? So that's that's uh, the burning uh, going on as the Japanese arrived. So they can see you can see that they saw that the city was being burned before they arrived. Now immediately 
the Japanese uh, showed uh, wanted to create a semblance of normality. So they occupied the Rizal Memorial Library and Museum, which still exists today, uh, and made it in the Imperial Japanese headquarters. And then they had uh, the city hall was uh, was left uh, uh, intact. There was a uh, the puppet mayor was appointed because the mayor left. No, in a half and evacuated. But they would assign Japanese officials beside the mayor the whole time. So everything he decided on uh, had to be passed on to Japanese officer for him to read with, uh, together with an interpreter, mostly one of those who owned Japanese stores in Cebu before the war. The same is true, is true with the capital. Although when, when the Japanese arrived, Governor Ilario Abeliana left office and went to Badian and stayed there until about two months or a month before he was recalled at pain of uh, the execution of his family. This building also exists. It became the consulate of Japan during when uh, Laurel was installed as president and, uh, the, of the Republic, uh, Japanese-sponsored Republic. It later became also the consulate of the United States. Now, immediately the Japanese uh, announced a return to work order and uh, told everyone that they should follow the Japanese military who are friend who are who are there with good intentions, etc. And they used the name of Ilario Abeliana, even if he had already evacuated, he would come back later. At the same time, the Japanese organized uh, what is called the Hoko system, no Hoko, Hoko system, or Tonarigui. First implemented in Taiwan, this is a copy of the Baojia system of administrative control. Uh, in, 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 in China. You know? um, in just this is what, what would be in the whole ecosystem, is distributing food, rationing, and also that anyone who inflicts or attempts to inflict an injury on Japanese soldiers or on the individuals will be shot to death. The assailant, you know, uh, if can, it cannot be found, they will hold 10 influential person hostages who live in and about the, the streets or municipalities where the event happens, so where the hoko the core area, you know, the, the village area. So there's a kind of, of, of warnings that the Japanese started. They started very badly. They had all these kinds of things that they did all these grim warnings that instead of inviting people to, to love them and like them, you know, uh, like the Americans, the Americans also did a lot you know, when they invaded the Philippines in, uh, during the Philippine-American War. They also caused a lot of damage and a lot of atrocities, but they would, you would never find this kind of, of announcement from the Americans. You know? so, so very strange for the... So there was, if you know, there was a constant battle of, between the propaganda arm of the Japanese and the military. You know? The propaganda arm would wonder do not do that because, you know, how can we get the Filipinos to love us or to, to support us if you behave like that and all that. So, so these are all tell, very telling you know, of, of the kinds of measures that the Japanese did. Immediately, food stops were controlled. You know, and this in Cebuano, and there's another one in uh, Ilongo, you know, which you can find at Museo Subo. The other one, by the way, the earlier announcement, a very rare one you can also find at Museo Subbo, the War Memorial Gallery at Museo Subbo. So everything was rationed. Uh, everyone was was told not to hoard on gas, on food, and all that. Even cars were to be surrendered. At the same time, the Japanese also created all kinds of associations, no? food associations, restaurant associations, bar owners associations, transport associations, cochero associations. But the, the, the economy was you know, in, in shambles. And the best example you have of, of how people eked out their lives during the Japanese occupation is uh, John Gokungwe's um, a biography of, of as a young boy in Cebu, uh, third year high school at San Carlos, he decided to uh, do a business, not bring uh, what is this, cigarettes, and I, uh, use tires, I think, in Cebu, and use a batel, a sailboat, to go to Manila to buy cigarettes and sell them to, to, to Cebu. You know? It was a very dangerous experience. He had to hide many times because the Japanese were patrolling the seas and were preventing anyone from involving themselves in black marketeering. But this is really black marketeering business. And he, he was 13 years old at the time. No, and the famous uh, story is that he used a bike to go around uh, in, in his business. And here is a, 
group of, of the Cebu Restaurant and Hotel Honors Association uh, greeting the Imperial Japanese Navy on its anniversary sometime in May, May 27, I think. Uh, yeah. So the Japanese also, uh, the first they invited Senator Vicente Rama, he had his publications called Bagong Kusog, Progress and the Way of Huersa. Eventually, eventually only one was left, the Bagong Kusog, which is a very famous for, uh, the news magazine uh, appearing every Friday in, in all over the Visayas of Mindanao and was even circulated in Hawaii. He was offered the, to, res, to re, resurrect his paper, but he, he declined. So the Japanese established their own called Visayan Shimbun, and when Laurel was, uh, the Philippine Republic was inaugurated, the Visayan Shinbun ceased operations and in its place came the Cebu Times now in 1943. So there was a propaganda machinery going on here. At the same time, governance in Cebu, like in much of the, well, all of the Philippines, was handled by one party called the Kalibapi. No, kapisanan sa paglilingkod sa bagong Pilipinas. You have here the father, the grandfather of President Benigno Aquino III, who was the head of the Kalibapi. He was in prison after the war together with Laurel on accusations of treason, no, eventually released. But his Visayas commissioner, so the assistant for the Visayas, was Paulino Gullias, who worked with the guerrillas at the same time worked with the with the Japanese authorities, he, he walked the tightrope. You know? His body was never found when uh, during the Japanese American uh, invasion of Cebu, all these officers were gathered together by the Japanese, brought with them as leverage to the mountains as they retreated up north. They were used as uh, probably as leverage to the locals so that they could probably get food or whatever. But um, apparently, the place where they were. In was bombed by the where they were hiding. In was bombed by American liberation bombers uh, <clears throat> somewhere near what you find today is Marco Polo Hotel and all those areas. So their bodies like, of, of Gullias and Governor Lazaro was never found. At the same time, however, the Japanese left us a legacy in Cebu. They opened an alternate airport on Mactan Island. And this is the, that airport that eventually became the Mactan Interna Cebu International Airport. You know? it's, it's quite ironic. War is really ironic you know? that, that the Japanese built this airport as an alternative to, to Lahog because they, they, it was, they, they knew that it, it, during bombings it would be hit. So they, had, they made this, but they hid the airplanes in all these small you know, camouflaged areas. And then fast forward in 1999 or 1992, uh, 1992, the airport of the, of the Mactan Simon Airport before this beautiful one was funded by the Japanese. No? That, that's the irony of war. No, they established this, they, uh, they invaded us, and then 40 years later, they inaugurate, they spend for the airport as a, as a proud contribution of Philippine-Japanese friendship. So the, at the same time, almost immediately after the invasion happened, the guerrilla resistance began. No? MacArthur ordered all the Yusafi forces to establish guerrilla bases for intelligence purposes. Many of these guerrillas did not follow, well, all of these guerrillas did not follow uh, MacArthur's order not to engage the enemy, but just to gather um, intelligence for the eventual return of for his eventual return of the return of the American forces. In Cebu, there was a dual leadership of the Cebu Area Command. That's the main guerrilla resistance group. Cushing handled the military side. Lieutenant Harry Fenton handled the administrative side. And Fenton was a very erratic character. As you would read in, in, in many uh, publications and on the internet, he was very, very paranoid. He had no military experience. They split the... Uh, Headquarters, uh, Cushing was in Tabunan up here uh, in Cebu, near uh, at the where famous tourist air spots right now, tourist areas uh, of the Trans Central Highway, where there's a lot of zip lining and all kinds of, of, of restaurants and cafes and hotels and all that. Very near there is the, uh, the guerrilla headquarters of James Cushing is very sad that it's not marked by a national historical marker or the, the Cebu City Cultural and Historical Affairs Commission has already worked for the last three years to do that. 
no? work with a local, with a barangay there to find a place to put up a market. Fenton, on the other hand, was in Compostela and he created a kind of kingdom there and was even accused of, you know, uh, sleeping with underaged girls and all that, making so much and killing all his pre-war uh, enemies. He was a radio personality manager of the KZRC, uh, the radio station in, in Cebu. And he made a lot of enemies apparently. And during the war, he killed a lot of these people, uh, just accused them of being collaborators with no evidence and killed them. We know this because Colonel Manuel Segura, adjutant of the Cebu Area Command, eventually wrote Tabunan, the exploits of the, the untold exploits of the Philippine, of the Cebu guerrillas, no? which has been reprinted and, update and, and uh, annotated by the Ramon Aboitis Foundation, Incorporated. That's the book, The Untold Exploits of the Famed Cebu Guerrillas in World War II. No? There's a new version of that, uh, it's annotated. There are, explanations it's, it's, it's for people who don't know where the places are that we discussed. And this is Tabunan, no? and you see the cities down there below from this area. But the, if the Japanese had propaganda, the Cebuanos also had counter propaganda. And the, this is the Morning Times, the newspaper that the, that the Cebuanos, uh, that the guerrillas started. No? The Morning Times, which eventually became a newspaper a daily after the war and was published continuously until martial law uh, happened in 1972. Uh, all the newspapers were, were uh, ceased, ceased operations under military rule. And uh, they had a water mill that ran on a generator somewhere in Barili, which was used to print uh, this very small sheet. Uh, now, uh, the Cebu Area Command movements were well documented by the Japanese. These are, in fact, maps taken from Japanese sources no, of the movements of the, Jap of the Americans, the Eastern and Western Westerns Visayas no, by military intelligence. All in all, the, the, when the when, uh, Cebu Area Command was eventually given recognition in 1943 by MacArthur, no, it took a long time, about almost a, over a year, because the Mindanao people, the Mindanao guerrillas headed by Colonel Fertig did not, did not like to recognize the Cebu Area Command. There was, there was all this constant, constant uh, rivalry, competition, distrust, mistrust among all these uh, guerrilla groups you know, in Negros, in Mindanao and all that. So Colonel Cushing took a long time and the Cebu Area Command to get recognition and support from uh, MacArthur. But when they did around 1943, uh, radios were sent uh, for them to communicate directly to the Southwest Pacific Area Command of MacArthur in uh, Darwin or, or, or Perth, or yeah, Darwin, I think, uh, Australia. No? And so these are the locations of those uh, radio stations and, uh, and, and, and in themselves are guerrilla bases, no? headed by Major Hale, Espiritu, Trazo, Albenda, and, and Colonel Cushing at Tabunan. Hail in Danao, Espiritu somewhere up in the north of Ming Lanilia, Trazo somewhere in Dubandu. Now, in around 1944, no, where the guerrillas were gathering intelligence, life in Cebu was, you know, uh, uh, eking out. No? Everybody was, was trying to live their lives as much as they could. No? Cebu was, by the way, uh, cordoned off Cebu City with a bamboo wall. Uh, we had our own intramuros during the Japanese occupation and you had to bow every time you had, you entered these gates. There were, I think, two or four gates in the, on the south two and on the north uh, two also. Uh, somewhere in Mabolo and the other in, uh, somewhere near where you, you have the old Hayalai, Kinalumsan Bridge near uh, CIT, Cebu Institute of Technology University. Uh, further, to that, there would but that would be where the bamboo, uh, the, the fence would would begin, and you have to present your paper while you went out or while you were coming in, going in. Now, in 1944, around March 30, March 31st, as the Japan Americans were leapfrogging from island to island, uh, winning the war, uh, the the navy battles, they were clearly heading towards the Philippines. Uh, 
the uh, admiral of the combined Japanese fleet, the head Admiral Minichi Koga, decided to abandon the, uh, the fleet headquarters in uh, Saipan, if I'm not mistaken, and move this to Davao because uh, it, it, it could no longer be defensible. So many Navy ships of the Japanese were already destroyed. And uh, so they would do a final defense before the homelands, uh, prevent as much as possible the Americans from going into the home islands, you know, the Japanese home islands. And the defense would be in, in, based in Davao. So early in the, <clears throat> I mean, late in the evening, the Admiral Minichi Koga and uh, Vice Admiral Shigeru Fukudome went on their separate ways riding a Kawanishi flying boat to proceed to Davao. Unfortunately for them, they met uh, they met a cloud burst, a, a thunderstorm or a storm. And um, the Kawanishi flying boats, they were separated. Uh, my, my, the one where Koga was on was never found. No? There are many people say, no, it, they also fell together in Cebu. No, no. There is no evidence of that. In fact, uh, the, the eyewitness accounts, the eyewitnesses who were interviewed by Colonel Segura, they were still alive when Colonel Segura wrote the Koga Papers book, also his Tabunan book. They only mentioned one airplane that they heard exploded you know, and fell on uh, the beach between San Fernando and Carcar, the two, Carcar City and San Fernando, and uh, in Sangat, which is the border to Carcar and San Fernando, Sangat and Valladolid. No? Uh, Ricardo Bolo, Teniente del Barrio, around 2 a.m., he is awakened by the roar of an airplane engine flying at a low altitude. Uh, according to Shikero Fukudome, the pilot was lost and was groggy because of uh, fighting against the storm, trying to find a way out you know, from the storm. And so he got lost and, and, and didn't know where he was, you know, according to and that might have happened also to, to Koga. Now, for this is very, this is very uh, sad turn of events because an earlier boat, a, a flying boat, had left earlier and had reached the vow. So they were wondering where are the two others, you no? Know? <clears throat> so, Bolo, as it happens, was a procurement officer of the Cebu Area Command, the Unified Guerrilla Outfit in Cebu. At the same time, Colonel Nene Matuga, Cornelio Matugas volunteer guard of one of the volunteer guards of a commander of the Barrio Sangat San Fernando area is, is also awakened by the same sound. And they witness, he witnesses a seaplane bursting in flames as it plunges to the sea. Uh, in the morning, Pedro Guantuanco, a fisherman of Sitio Bas, Barrio Perilos, which is now part of the, the, uh, Barrio Valladolid at the time, sees an object bobbing on the surface of the sea while he's taking breakfast. He calls out to his neighbor, Rofo Opoiwamar, to retrieve the object, as he could not do so himself. Okay, now, he has had gout, no, uh, he could not walk. <clears throat> Opoi brings what, what appears to be a black box, something like that, tomobako, as the Japanese would call it. Uh, there's, there was a red leather portfolio inside. The box also had some oil slick in it. He places the box on a baroto or a boat, covers the box from you, and then anchors the boat some 20 meters inland no, from the shore as people are, were starting to go to the shoreline to meet fishermen who were on their back from their morning catch. And this is really very strange because um, the Japanese immediately, because there were survivors no, uh, who swam towards, the, towards San Fernando and met with the mayor. So they knew immediately that there, were, there was a plane that... that, that uh, crashed, so the Japanese were be, began searching. They didn't know what, what, what that plane was. They had no idea who was on board. But they started you know, inspecting boats, but they never inspected this boat of, of Womar. No? In the evening, Womar retrieves the box, and with his neighbor, Pedro Gauntuanco, he opens it, takes out the letter portfolio, is full of do documents, all written in Japanese, as thick as a school dictionary. It's soaking wet with a letter Z, this one, emblazoned on its cover. And hence the name show or victory plan, or the show plan. <clears throat> there were also <clears throat> five or six, six sets of papers held by fasteners. And uh, so they dry it on the bamboo floor of Walmart's house overnight. 
The red portfolio also contains small cloth bag with six condoms inside and some gold nuggets the size of corn grains. No? The Japanese bring them, apparently brought them up with them. 200 Japanese Navy men begin to raid city bus because uh, immediately after 11, uh, 12, 11 uh, survivors were arrested by the by the fishermen, but two others or three others escaped to San Fernando and went to the city hall, municipal hall. And there the puppet mayor, Rabor, uh, called up, uh, called Cebu uh, headquarters uh, the, of the Onishi, Butai, the Onishi command under Colonel Onishi, and uh, <clears throat> informed them that there were survivors of a plane. No? So a search was done, but the Tokyo government did not inform the Onishi Butai that this was an important mission and other people inside uh, on board were very important people. So Onishi did not know, he just thought that they, these were just, you know, survivors of a trip from somewhere who were being caught by uh, um, uh, the, the Cebu area command. So they, they raided city bus, they find nothing. So Gan, because of this heat, Gantuankov decides by evening to place the documents in a buyot or bag made of woven plant fiber, usually bamboo or, no, not bamboo, <clears throat> uh, buri, uh, bu bu buri, and bury them on the ground beneath his house. The following day, the uh, following evening, worried about the continued harassment and torture of his neighbors, Gantuanko digs the buyot of documents and turns them over to Corporal Norberto Varga. He burns the wooden box container. Later, he hands over the red portfolio to Varga. These papers eventually reached Colonel James Cushing at the headquarters in Tabunan. Days later, nine days later, the first batch of these documents arrive, uh, well, Z-Plan documents are packed in two empty mortar shells and are sent together with two Americans, Snell and Dyer to Lieutenant Andrews in <clears throat> Southern Negros to await their shipment to Australia via the submarine Krival. All this time, Cushing has been telegraphing uh, the SWPA saying that we have 10, we have arrested 10 Japanese. One of them looks like an officer, he's probably a general from Makassar. He did not know that this was Vice Admiral Shigeru Fukudome. In fact, until the end of the war, Kashin would not know that he was a very important uh, Vice, the Vice Admiral. No? So uh, Dyer and uh, Russell Snell uh, brought, uh, brought to the submarine Krival, and the material is, the papers are brought to the to the uh, to Australia for translation. On May 5th, the de Admiral Minichi's death is announced in Japan. Two days late, before that, uh, on 3rd May, Admiral Somu Toyoda is, was appointed to replace him. The Southwestern, uh, the Southwest Pacific Area Command eventually put two and two together. Now this airplane crash and now this announcement. This could be related to each other. This, this could be it. The first batch of the Z-Plan documents are eventually transported on board the submarine Krival on 11 May. So it's been almost or more than a month already. The Japanese keep on searching, raping, uh, you know, doing all kinds of, not raping, uh, it's killing so many fisher folk you know, and torturing many of them to find out because by then the, the Onishi Butai was already informed that there were documents brought by Koga. Uh, the, the, it's called the Utsu incident in Japan. So five days later, the documents are intercepted while the submarine is Darwin. From there, the documents are in plain tubers. In Anaka, that was how important it was that the, the Krival was ordered to stop on its way to Darwin and the uh, documents were brought by plane to Brisbane for immediate translation by the Allied Translation and Interpretation Service. On 23 May, limited copies of the translated Z-Plan are distributed, one to General George Marshall and another to MacArthur. Two others are sent to Admiral Chester Nimitz, head of the 7th, US 7th Fleet at Pearl Harbor. Nimitz did not like the translation. He ordered a second modified translation of the documents and they were all amazed at the detailed information of the sea plan showing the Japanese plan for the victorious defense of the Philippines to halt the American drive towards Japan. The last stance of defense would be in the Philippines. Copies were then sent immediately to the various commands 
of the battle theater, of all the Navy commanders that were given copies. The original documents, meanwhile, in Japanese, are brought back to Cebu from Australia and refloated on the same area where they were first found so that the Japanese would not suspect that the uh, American forces already knew about the show plan. And the Japanese were full. They never, uh, they only altered a little part of the show plan. And this, this is quite strange. This is one of the greatest intelligence blunder on the part of the Japanese, that they knew that they knew that the documents were lost for about two months and then they found it and they never altered the plan. What was the result of the plan? <clears throat> well, to cut the story short, MacArthur decided that instead of landing at Sarangani in December, the landing would happen in Leyte because the Visayas was undefended. No, as Rico would tell you, there was general I forgot who was uh, assigned to defend the Philippines just arrived from from Japan during the invasion of Dr. Rico Jose. Uh, would tell you that the, he was he, the general arrived in the in Manila just in time for the late uh, landing of MacArthur and his his first uh, question was where is late where is Rete no? where is late so that's how unprepared the Japanese were no they didn't have uh, any inkling no? there, there was of course a garrison in late there was a Japanese presence there but it was a weak one. No? Very weak. That's why MacArthur decided. Unfortunately for all of us, MacArthur in his memoirs, all the American reports do not mention the Koga incident. Do not mention. They, there's, there's just one very brief footnote of the finding of intelligence records somewhere in the in the Pacific area, which helped uh, in the war, which helped, you know advance the war and it is in the Pacific area. This is a very sad way of treating uh, for the Americans no? and for MacArthur himself. A very sad way of treating a very important document where many Cebuanos suffered uh, as a result just to have it sent to Australia. and to, It advanced the uh, liberation, but it's never acknowledged. No, It's never acknowledged. They, they, it would have painted MacArthur as someone who relied on on in, only on intelligence, no? so he, you, you will understand why he avoided mentioning that. But well, that's MacArthur anyway. So meanwhile, <clears throat> in Cebu, as the Americans approached, no, leapfrogging from island to island, so did the atrocities happen in in Cebu. The Kamika, the, the Kampaitai were becoming jittery. This was a military police designed to discipline. Japanese soldiers, but for some reason, they also were tasked with disciplining what they suspected were Filipinos who were resisting the Japanese occupation. And their Visayas headquarters was at Cebu Normal School. Their Cebu City headquarters was somewhere in the port area. The Cebu Normal School was called the Castle of Horrors by people. And this was the Kampetai headquarters. And below the the ground floor and the second floor below the base on the basement. There were so many people who were imprisoned and tortured. They were just given a onigiri bowl of rice with salt. And then they, according to uh, one of the survivors who wrote the book, Memories of War to Remember by um, Ovito Abeliana, they'd have a can of a sardine can where they would urinate. And they'd have another can where the, there's, a, there's a pail of water where they all drank and someone would die in front of them. And the Japanese would not take him for the next two to three days. He would smell really bad. You know, one of those that were tortured did not survive. And so this was the kind of experience they had. And they did so many of them wrote with their, you know, found in what nail, whatever, uh, something sharp and put all the dates that they were incarcerated. And for the longest time, this was, this was all over the basement of the Cebu Normal School. And, in came one of the university presidents. He painted it. She painted, or he she painted it over. So it's all gone. You, you, it's been cleansed. You wouldn't find us. It. So it's a sad, sad reminder of how much we, we, we. I mean, how how, how little we, we treat the past. No. So many people were buried also there at the Cebu Normal University, and there are buildings being put up there. I don't know if. 
they found the skeletons there. They, 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 they should be a, a market. Anyway, <clears throat> that's me. I need to attend to matter a lot like General Chinovit. Uh, in Japanese atrocities, there were one in Tumano and Barile. They were killing a lot of people. The famous uh, tortures and executions of relatives of, of a guerrilla officer, a Kausin, the Kausin family were brought to Barili and they were all tortured there, bayoneted. There was a compost pit at the back where one of the women was raped and brought there with all his wounds and she would be crying the whole night and the neighbors would hear it until the following day, the, the, the cries were gone. She had already died. This is when the, the skeletons were retrieved by the CIC when investigating. You know? and, uh, there's also a massacre of Chinese in Kurva, Medellin around 21 October 1944, a day before the late landings. Now, when the late landings happened, many of the Japanese who lost their boats, ships, their ships sunk, they would swim and find barotos, whatever. And at least, so, as it happens, Kamote's Islands in Cebu is very near Leite, near Ormo, near Bai Bai. Many of them would swim here, would swim to this, and then they would be you know, caught by the locals. The Japanese uh, garrison officer in Cebu, upon hearing of this event, went to to the Dap to uh, there's so many massacre sites in in Camotes, but the most famous one is Dap Dap, where they gathered all the residents on the pretext of giving them rations of rice. And they were all bayoneted there; they were all shot there. When Americans arrived; uh, it, the bodies were still there. This is an American investigation, CIC, around December. No? after the massacre, three three weeks after the massacre day. Uh, no, 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 after the March 26 landings, they went there, the bodies were still there. No, they were still there, that's very sad. And then the liberation of Cebu happened. On March 26, 1945, the Americans landed. This is a preparatory map, photo map of Cebu before the, the uh, liberation. It was used for, to determine where the bombs should fall. Should fall. The operation that uh, liberated Cebu, the American military operation, was called Victor II. It was headed by, it was carried out by the American Division, later the 31st Infantry Division. It was headed by General William Arnold. Underneath it was the 132nd, 182nd, and later the 164th Infantry Regiments of uh, the Cebu Area Command. I mean, the American Division and the 81st and 82nd Infantry Regiments late of, of, that absorbed the Cebu Area Command. No. On the other side of the Japanese were, were the 35th Army, the 1st Division, headed by uh, General Tadas Kataoka, 102nd Division by Lieutenant General Simpi Fukui, and uh, Takeo Manjomi who headed the 173rd Independent Battalion guarding Cebu and the 33rd Naval Base Force, 36th Guard Force, uh, headed by Rear Admiral Kaku Harada. So there was an intermixing of all these, of all the survivors of the late war battle and all that. So people, would be, Japanese soldiers would be moved around. Before that, September 12, the Americans, prior to the October landings at Leyte, General William Halsey sent his airplanes to start testing uh, bombing raids in the Visayas. And it was clear that the Visayas was undefended. No? They destroyed so many of the airplanes at La Hub, Colegio de, Seminar, Colegio de San Carlos was destroyed, the pier, the port, everything was all that. The Japanese, meanwhile, had pill boxes built in, in, and tank barriers uh, in Ilihan. They improved on the tank barriers which were built by the Filipinos early in, in the, before the start of the war. And the Americans, it was now the Americans' turn to bomb uh, the facilities that the Japanese also bombed, like the oil refinery of that. Uh, here is the Texas oil refinery, coconut oil. Oh no, uh, petroleum, uh, uh, no, coconut oil. And here's Philippine refining, besides refining company, coconut oil. Uh, Buta, 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 uh, Texaco was taken over by a Japanese firm that produced butane, but, butanol made of alcohol. And here, this is the Philippine refining company later occupied by the Japanese and destroyed. This is San Nicolas Church, already destroyed even before the American liberation bombings. You can see all the 
the, the where the bombs drop, you know, there's huge 1,000 pound bombs, uh, clearly. Yeah. And here's a bomb here because there's, a, this was a, a midget submarine base, San Nicolas, you know, where you find uh, uh, near where you buy all your dried fish in Tabuan. This is very near that area. Now, immediately, of course, from September 12, 1944, when the liberation bombings began, food became a very scarce, hunger and death. You know. but people, be, and then you have all these Japanese starting to arrive from all the battlefields, haggard and defeated. They arrived in the Philippines. They would steal food because they're all you know, demoralized. They'd go and look for women and rape them and all that. Japanese shipping was severely crippled, resulting in a lack of vital supplies from Japan and other occupied lands. Eventually, the Americans landed in Talisai, March 26. These are the photos of the landing. And the Japanese retreated up in the hills where you find the hotels and very expensive uh, housing right now and, and houses. Um, they burned St. Teresa's College while the Americans were at um, El Pardo, created a temporary base hospital. This is the Japanese defense of, of Cebu City, that's Lahug Airfield. So they decided the hills on top of Lahug, they would stay and defend to the last of their, of the, that they could you know, until supplies run out. So there you see the, the four-pronged approach of the Americans. When they came from Talisai, they immediately went up. Another group went to Mactan. Another group liberated Lahu. Another went to a five prongs. Another went to Buisan to protect the water source for Cebu. The great battles that were fought here were on Gochan Hill or Wat Hill, where so many Americans were killed. The Lahu Airfield and Babag, where you find Marco Polo Hotel and all these expensive uh, restaurants and hotels right now. That's Lahog Aerodrome, bombing of the hills where you pointing towards the area of Marco Polo Hotel and all those on the Ville Hills. This is where you find a Transcentral Highway today. No? This was pockmarked with so many uh, Japanese uh, digging tunnels and all kinds of putting all kinds of booby traps against the Americans. But they were no match for American airplanes that bombed them every day until May, from March 26 to around April 27, May 1st, May 2nd. So there was a chaos as, as, as shown. Um, in fact, <clears throat> Philip Cebuanos learned to mix food, no? uh, corn with, with camote, no? called sinanduloy, or even with the sap of banana trees, they would eat that. No? Eventually, the Japanese surrendered on August 28, 1945. This General William Arnold is shown here accepting the official sword, the sword of General Tadasu Katauka, I think. Um, Arnold, of course, angered MacArthur. MacArthur told Arnold, wait till the Japanese surrender at Tokyo Bay. General Arnold said, no, I don't have to wait for you. He, so the surrenders happened way ahead of the actual Japanese surrender at Tokyo Bay. And that's the, when I visited the son of General Arnold in Washington, in Virginia, he was very proud of saying that, that na isahan si MacArthur ni sa kanya, of his father, by his father. So these are the Japanese being uh, put into, into trucks. And as they went through town by town, people would throw rocks at them, all kinds of things. No? The America, even American soldiers guarding these Japanese would, would be hit by all the rocks no? and all that. So there were about 100 or 50 trucks, 100 trucks. And the luckier, the luckiest one, according to one survivor, one soldier, American soldier, he was lucky because he was on the first truck. So every time they went through the town, the, the locals did not know yet that this was a, these were Japanese surrender, so they didn't prepare anything. It's when the Truck number 14, I think, or 15 appeared that they jumped. the locals in every town knew that these were Japanese. So they start throwing all kinds of things. Basura, human feces, no? and all kinds of things. And imagine that. And then this is the repatriation that happened around December when the Japanese were brought to, back to Japan. But all those who committed atrocities were left behind here at Tabunok Talisai, where there was a prisoner of one camp, and these are 
some of those uh, who were accused of uh, atrocities. In the aftermath of war, you can see Cebu. Uh, many of you in Manila are told that Manila was the second most devastated city after Warsaw. Well, Manila is big, maybe that's why, but only half of Manila south of the passing was devastated. Cebu, you can count how many buildings stood here after the war. No? You have Bank of the Philippine Islands, the Customs House, the two churches, Cathedral and Basilica del Santo Nio are still standing. But all the rest of the warehouses are all shells. Compania Maritima is still standing. And you have Cebu Normal School and the Capitol there and Vision Theater. Those are the only buildings that survived the war. So you know, Cebu is a more devastated city actually than Manila. There is no such thing as the North being uh, saved from, from liberation bombings or from the atrocities of the Japanese. No? Now, sadly, the Japanese withdrew to the hills on March 26, 1945. They didn't stay. Very few of them stayed on, in the city. But the Japanese, the Americans kept on bombing to flush them out, whoever would st stayed here because of the experience of the Manila, uh, the taking of Manila by the Americans. So they thought there would be a house to house uh, war here, battle here, like uh, uh, that happened in Manila. So they bombed everything. And you see, Cebu City is totally devastated. On September 9, the anniversary of birthday anniversary of Serios Menya, there was a liberation victory over Japan Day Parade. But the North was still at war. Oh, wait, no. The Japanese had already surrendered by then. Now, the Japanese have built a statue here at Marco Polo where so many of their dead died. They have a canon there, a Kuan Yin, no? the goddess of mercy. And they celebrate every August, they go there, the anniversary of the atom bombing, the atomic, the, the, the Nagasaki or Hiroshima atom bomb, when they were dropped they, in between those day six and 13, I think, they come here to celebrate. There's no such ceremony for Filipinos, no? except for the March 26 uh, liberation landings, which are commemorated in Talisay. Now in 2014, some of the veterans from Vietnam of the American Division War, American Division the 31st, came here. No? Remember they were the famous division that caused the My Lai massacre, but these are not the guys, but that was that division also. <clears throat> they came here and put up a monument. No? This is a Japanese marker at Plaza Independencia. There's a Japanese memorial marker for Filipinos and Japanese who died. But there's no Filipino marker yet on, on the main plaza of the city. This one is at the surrender site, 103 kilometers north of the city, you know, put up by the American division. So we, should, we need to put up more of these you know, and preserve, re conserve the remains of the war and carry out interviews perhaps of those that survived the war. And this is the basement where the Ekempetai would keep all this of the all our compatriots who died here or were tortured. And it, it's been painted over very sadly. So I hope Cebu, as I keep on repeating whenever I make presentations, would develop an army heritage trail, publish some of the works. We published some of these works at the University of San Carlos, like In Death Shadow, which talks of Campetai atrocities or the moments of war to remember by the experience of Jovito Abellana in the war, including his incarceration and torture at the Castle of Horror and our own book, uh, War in Cebu. So that ends my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Hi. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Bersales, for that very comprehensive and very educational lecture. Marami na naman akong natutunan. <laughs> Karina, my question, have I read uh, yung book ni Segura on the Kogo Papers? I have a long time ago, so it's medyo nalimutan ko na. So it's very nice now that, you know, uh, ayun, yun, that uh, I'm getting refreshed uh, about it. There's also, Jobs, if I'm not mistaken, there was a documentary. I can't remember if it's Discovery about that. Eh? If it's Discovery, not Geo or yeah. NHK. It, it was, I think, uh, Discovery. I please unmute Jobs. Um, yeah, hello, yeah, can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me now? No audio, just so. Are you unmuted mm -hmm. now, Jobs? 
Yeah. Yes. Hello. Yes. Ah, oh, okay. May audio na daw. Oh. Hindi ko naririnig si Jobbers right now. <laughs> Maybe my, uh, ano. Oh, okay. Medyo, pun, ano to? Ah, alright. Medyo delayed tong aking uh, computer. Uh-huh. Anyway. Alright. So, um, we have a lot of, ano, questions. Teka ha. Hi, uh, I'd like to shout out muna to some of our viewers. Ambassador Virginia Reyes is uh, watching. Hi, Tito Virgie. Thanks for uh, watching. Marami rin siyang questions for you, Jobs. And uh, a lot of people from uh, the, the Cebu area are watching. Mga nag nag sa sa'yo. Margo Kamaya, my friend from Cebu, is also watching. Bong Mamuad of Mount Samat National Shrine. Hi, thank you all for watching. Robin Ferguson from Virginia. So, hi, hi. Thank you for watching. All right, so uh, we'll start the, some of the questions, ha? Huh? Yeah. Um, uh, a comment muna. The father of, from, from Ambassador Virgilio Reyes, the father of national artist Hemino Abad is a renowned Filipino-Spanish yep. writer from Barili. From Barili, I believe yes. Jimmy Abad has written a poem in honor of his father, which mentions oh. Barili. Yeah, his father was from Barili, yes. Oh, may, ano, may, may magandang comment? Salamat, Sensei, Jobbers, Reyes, Versales. <laughs> sensei talaga, ang daming alam ni, ano, ni Dr. Versales. Kaya po siya ang inibitahan Thank natin you. dahil alam kong magiging maganda ang ating episode with Dr. Versales. Um, and now here, another question. Um, is there a formal list of those who served in the Japanese-run administration in Cebu? And correspondingly, correspondingly, were there Filipino guerrillas in this area? Maybe were there like yung katulad ni Gullias kanina, you know, yeah. walking a tightrope, namamangka sa yeah. dalawang ilog, something like that. Yeah. Well, there were there were rabid pro-Japanese mayors and there were those who who walked the tightrope as it were. So you had two kinds of, of local government officials here. There's a list, of course, of all the puppet mayors. Some of them were brought to, to court, not to trial, eventually released. Because, you know, the problem with politics is mga nationalista sila lahat before the war or mga liberal. And then afterwards, uh, naging mga collaborators. And then after the war, election time na 1946, you needed these leaders still. No? So so that's, that's, that's what happened. There's a list of all these uh, government officials who participated in, in the... Japanese occupation and there's also there, uh, you can actually go to the website of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office Vivao. they've already uploaded the list of about uh, 9,000 guerrillas of the Cebu Area Command 9,700 guerrillas of the Air, Cebu Area Command so there's a list there complete with their ranks and all that Yeah, over 9,000 Jobs, you mentioned about the there's nine thousand more or less of the uh, yeah. guerrillas in the Cebu area command. Was there like a another guerrilla you guerrilla uh, group in Cebu or a rival group of uh, the CAC? No, there, there was none. But there, 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 there is. It used to start. You know, it's the first groups started around uh, Dumanho until eventually they were all placed under the Cebu area command. So once the Cebu Area Command was established, no other guerrilla groups. Unlike in Leyte, that there were so many. I think there were. Uh, we 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 uh, we edited the Babcock Diary on the diary of of Babcock, the, the Bureau of Education uh, official who was who was trapped in Leyte during the war. And he wrote a very thick diary. We edited it. It's published by Ramona Boydis Foundation. And there was there was a lot of rivalry there. Same, I think, with Negros also, but uh, the rival of the Cebu Area Command, I think, if you read, uh, if you read uh, Tabunan, was the difficulty they had with with Colonel Fertig, Cushing's difficulty with uh, Wendell Fertig of Mindanao, who at first refused to recognize the Cebu Area Command, would not give them give the Cebu Area Command radio to communicate with MacArthur, 
So it took a long time for Cebu Area Command to get recognition. I think one year and about four months into the Japanese occupation. That's, that's how long they got to be recognized by MacArthur. But eventually they did get the recognition. Now, during the Koga incident, Kashin was demoted because he released the uh, prisoners. Because oh. Kashin was, Kashin had a heart, you know. He's, he's, he's forgotten by Cebu. He's forgotten in the Philippines. I think it took a while to look for his for his burial plot in the Libyan na mga bayani. He died anonymously while on board ship in uh, on the way to Palawan for a for a prospecting event as a minor post war. He never talked about the war, never wrote about the war. And uh, he was demoted, but he was his, his rank was restored. He was demoted because he released the 10 prisoners. Even if MacArthur said, do not release any prisoners. But Cebu was already, you know, the southern Cebu. The Japanese were killing almost everyone and torturing males. So he, he decided, I'd rather save the Cebuanos than right. these two ten prisoners. So it, it, it's a very noble part on the part of Cushing, but he's forgotten here in Cebu. Right. Very sad, no? And and I remember he, he he sent this telegram to MacArthur saying to the to this effect na situation here very hot, something like that. Yes. Kasi nga, they yeah. were killing a lot of Cebuanos. Is that the reason also why he uh, no, no, let go of Fukudome? He never found yeah. out that he Fukudome was his captive. He never found out until after the war when Fukudome oh. was interviewed by the Americans. And in, in this documentary yeah. that I watched years ago, <coughs> ma marunong kasi si Fukudome, hindi, hindi siya talaga nag-reveal, no? Yeah. <laughs> they thought, yeah. you know, they, they, the guerrillas had the feeling that there was a high-ranking officer there, but he never admitted to it, no? Just, yeah. um, parang he, he just um, let them assume that he was a, a lowly yeah. rank. Galing din, eh, no? <laughs> Pero Fukudome was frozen by the Japanese after that. He was wow. was brought to Tokyo and his rank and his everything he did, he was in Tokyo the whole time of the war. He was so, never g given any command after. It was an embarrassment. It's oh, embarrassing for a yes. vice admiral to, to be caught. Right. So he's frozen throughout the war. Jobs, yeah, that, I, 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 uh, hmm. in this documentary that I watched, can't remember if it's the documentary or something that I read. Uh, although Karina, you made it clear that kaya the, the Japanese garrison there knew of um, Sitio Bas because there were survivors who you know yeah. were able to escape. But there was one story, I don't know how true, that um, para daw malaman ng Japanese where the documents ended, parang they simulated uh, yeah. like papers, threw it in the ocean to they find out where it on the seas. Yeah. Ah. They, they had so many boxes floated on so many different places. And then the boxes would all converge in situ bus. Oh, so you have wow. the whole, the whole the, it's, the, it's that community that suffered so much. Right. And when you go to that place now, nobody remembers. Oh, wow. Oh, nobody man. Nobody remembers this happened. Grabe, no? And this is just, this is just semi-contemporary. Hindi pa ito masyadong matagal, yeah. di ba? That's a very sad part. Even here in Manila, uh, eh, eh, lumayo. The three World War II heroes nga were removed from the 1,000 peso bill yeah. diba? in lieu of yeah. you know the eagle. It's a majestic creature, yeah. but I don't think it serves the purpose of you know teaching our children and you know the younger generation about the values of patriotism and heroism. Hay nako. Yeah. <laughs> Nakakalungkot no. I think it's the same story everywhere. Anyway, I, there, there's a nice ano from Ruben Asuncion. Uh, Maayong gabi, Sir Jobbers. Good evening, everyone. Mm. With Fenton's actions in northern Cebu, these are somewhat uncannily similar to another American guerrilla leader's ruthless actions in northwestern Luzon. John O'Day. So, oh, yeah. I don't know about this. It's very interesting. So, he yeah. might he be from US FIP NL, northern Luzon, no? And Fenton, mm -hmm. Kwentuhan mo ah, kami ng konte jobs. Napaka, ano niyang tao na yan. Napaka, ang tawag dyan. Madaming kwento sa kanya. Yeah. Pedophile. I, 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 yeah. I understand the great grand niece is trying to write a story yes. about Feinstein. You know? That's his name is Feinstein. He has uh, German blood. He was here 
first in Manila, and then he was assigned to be a manager of the KZRC, the branch of KZRH in, in Manila. And he, he was very anti-Japanese uh, during the Chinese anti-Japanese boycotts. When, when Manchuria was invaded, he led, he was one of those who was very outspoken in Cebu against the Japanese. He knew when the Japanese arrived that they would look for him and kill him. So he went up in the north and then joined the Cebu Area Command. But he was paranoid. He, he had, a, he had, there's something mentally wrong with him. Uh, I think psychologically, he would sleep with young girls at night in his in his Bahai Kubo uh, in 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 the uh, uplands of Compostela, and he kept a lot of money. You know? He collected a lot of money from from locals. Remember, the suffering of the Filipinos was was twofold. No, but the story was that you had to bring a a Japanese money on one pocket and a underground money on the other. When you go to the market, you have to see whether ja, pro-Japanese itong kausap mo or whatever. So you know who what to pay because you, you, you're caught between two, two difficult situations. I mean, you, you, that's far from above and far from below. Para kang bingka, para kang bibingka. Mm -hmm. And uh, finds, uh, Fenton collected money from the locals. He kept a lot of money. He was the admin officer. His task was finance also. But he was so ruthless at collecting money. And then he'd ask families to provide their girls for him. For him. That's the story. He had a wife. He had kids. But I don't know what the wife did. No? Why this happened even with the wife present. Until eventually the Cebu Area Command got tired of him. Now when, when Kashing was in Negros uh, awaiting recognition for the Cebu Area Command, and instructions, I mean, uh, supplies of uh, guns and uh, radio equipment. That's when his assistant, uh, I forgot the name, from Pilamungahan, uh, did a court martial in his absence mm. and executed Fenton. Cushing actually left word that he should not be, uh, not he should not be executed. Now, the guy who executed him, Recaredo, I forgot his family name, was actually, according to another story, acting on the orders of the Japanese, that he was paid by the Japanese to infiltrate the Cebu Area Command. Now, I don't know if that's true because he's a hero in Pinamungahan town, so I, I have to be careful. He's considered a hero in, in the town where he came from. I know intelligence reports say that he was on the pay of, that's an allegation, that he was supposed to be on the pay of the Japanese. And the Japanese really wanted Fenton's head more than Cushing. Now, the strange thing, thing about Cushing and Onishi, Colonel Onishi, who headed the Imperial Japanese Navy Command in Cebu, was that Cushing actually, uh, in the one of the cases against Onishi, Cushing appeared as a witness for Onishi. As a witness? To defend, yes. Huh? To, oh. to witness for Onishi. He was asked if Onishi did any atrocities and all that. And I think for some reason he, he sent that documentation or he did not appear in that in that uh, hearing. So that, well, he, he did not witness, but I think he did not appear in the hearing so that the a case of uh, atrocities against Onishi was never filed. Oh. They, 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 they communicated during that, that, that moment and Onishi respected actually Kashing, no? Kashing. Well, during the negotiations, yeah. If you've read the story, they actually uh, the 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 they actually respected their dis their their agreements no? that the bombings of Tabunan would stop, and that they would exchange prisoners and everyone would be allowed to go free. Unishi, you know, knowing the Japanese, they could have routed Kashing afterwards, mm -hmm. but Unishi withdrew his forces mm -hmm. after. So he had deep respect for Kashing. And I think this affected Gashing after the war, that he did not appear uh, in one case against Onishi. In this particular case, I think. I see. On the atrocities so, committed in the South. So parang there was a gentlemanly agreement between them sometimes then. Yeah, um, um, yeah. Soldiers are like that. Eh? I think military officers are like that. Mm. They, they tend the to more gentlemanly. The, <laughs> yeah, something yes, like that. Yes, true. Actually, the the higher kadalasan, not always, kadalasan would uh, be more level-headed and you know, rather than the lowly privates, diba? In in yeah. that ano, um, in that light, Jobbers, kanina you showed a picture of 
after the, the Japanese surrender, there was a picture of uh, parang suspected war criminals or accused war yeah. criminals who stayed on in Cebu. Was Onishi one of them? Onishi was not. No? Ah. Onishi retired. He died, oh. I think, in the 1970s. Never wrote oh. anything. Died in 1974. He was, oh, see. He, he was the commander here. He knew what was going on. There were so many atrocities being done. But uh, he was never, I mean, there's command responsibility, but he was never incited. There were, there was, there were cases, but they could not find witnesses directly mm. pointing to him as ordering this kind of massacre, ordering this thing or that thing. In fact, unlike Manila, Manila was, you know, the, the commander there ordered house to house and to burn the South mm. and rape a lot of people. That did not happen in Cebu. Onishi never ordered. The plan they was, went up to the hills. Yes, immediately on the, when the Americans landed, they all withdrew. I mean, the days days before the landing, they were already moving things to the mountains, to the hills. They I probably see. knew about what was done in Manila and were warned not to do the same thing or whatever. Probably. But they never did that. Yeah. Yes, probably true. Uh, okay. Meron pang maraming questions, ha? Jobbers, wag ka magsawa. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, okay. I wrote some of them. Kasi iba sa messenger ko nagsisend. All right, here. Why do you think there? Why do you think these World War II sites are not preserved and no markers? How do you think this can be solved? This is a pro uh, question from Gabi Siguera. Why do you think well, there are no markers, or why is the history there not preserved? Well, not just there, no, even here. And how do you think this can be resolved as as part of NCCA jobs? Ano bang mga mga programa ng NCCA? <laughs> Trabaho yan ng NHCP. <laughs> the meeting the, calling, uh, calling uh, the the local and the local what is this uh, historical societies board of the NHCP the group is meeting next week. Oh, next week, Na jobs. National conference. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, we should see each other. Ambet is coming over, but kami ni Ambet may arrangement that we'll go around after. Anyway, so. It's it, it's one. It's not in the history books. We we don't have discussions of the war as a chapter or as a, a lengthy discussion in history mm. books. It's brushed aside. We tend to concentrate on the Katipunan events, no, because that's the birth of the republic. We're also ambiguous on the on the role of Laurel on the establishment of the of the uh, the, the puppet republic. It's recognized, no, it's it's recognized as the third republic. The other is many, most soldiers of the war never talk to their children about what happened. And so their children and their grandchildren, they, they make fun, they make jokes of their of the uniform, the medals. They play around with it without understanding why their Lolo has those medals. It, it's called PTSD, no? They, they call it PTSD, I think. I, I, yeah, it's, it's the trauma of war. That's why many people, many soldiers don't talk about it. So as a result, you have only veterans associations. And then they meet, they have all these monuments and all that. And but they're all dying. There are very few veterans left. And they're, you know, they're semi, I mean, some of them are still of good mind, sound mind, but the rest are bedridden. So their children cannot campaign for them to stop. You know, I saw one city here in Cebu. Uh, there was a they had a beautiful veterans park with a cannon and a soldier on top of a monument. I came back last year and it's gone. Wow. And I saw that two years ago. The, the monument to the soldier and it's, they beautified their plaza. Yes, good. It's now very beautiful. But where's the monument to the soldier? It's gone. So it's also because we are a generation that didn't go to war. So we don't... Well, I went to war. I mean, I was in Pagadian when it was attacked during the MNLF battles in 1973. So I've experienced three days of Continuous bombing and thankfully, at a seven as a seven year old, I didn't have PTSD. No, we we, we saw it as fun. All these airplanes diving near our house and wow. all these bullets whizzing past. So I, I I have that kind of memory. So I'm, maybe that drew me drew me to to study the war. But many people have, do not go to do not have never been to the war to war. We don't also have a war museum. Mm -hmm. There are no war museums. The Philippines has no war museum. I don't know why, no? We don't have a single 
monolith national war museum. We don't have war museums in every, I mean, there's a private museum in Negros that has gathered all the materials of the war, but that's it. Even in Cebu, we just set up a small gallery and it's so hard to find the evidences of the war. It's been deleted, so. So that's the, that's the result. That's why it's an uphill battle. It's a work, you're correct, with NCCA and HCP and private organizations. No, it's a good thing that your foundation is is you know reminding everyone. But we're speaking to the choir, I think. Everyone attending here is interested in the war. Right. And uh, but we should expand. I mean, these these are videos that stay forever on YouTube and Facebook. I hope this, for example, DepEd. And, and all that will they're, they're they're putting putting back ROTC for example see uh, Vice President Zara they should we should understand why the ROTC was born in the first place no? mm -hmm. it's to prepare for the eventuality of war and so there should there should be discussions about what really happened in the war so that we will not forget because it's not easy to to go hungry no but I mean, I, I know many uh, families they lost relatives because they were raped or killed and uh, all that. And then they had, I know one that the, their brother was on an island and had no food to eat and died there. We've not experienced that. We have only a few, you know, three days of a typhoon and then all the relief comes in. Uh, Abra, I mean, I'm not belittling the earthquake in Abra, but you get relief immediately. In the war, you get relief, but only for a few days. And then the four years that it stretches, there's no relief, right. and that's something we should not, we should, we should always uh, take to heart that we should never go to war. You know? Right. So and if we don't, if we don't, yeah, if we don't remember, we will do it again. Yes, there's, there's. I think we're the only occupied country na wala talagang dedicated World War II museum. So hence yeah. our foundation worked with Intramuros administration and we just opened, it's not a museum, but it's, it's uh, I think it's fair enough. We opened an exhibit. For those mm. who nagahanap ng pupuntahan, punta po kayo sa Fort Santiago, sa Old American Barracks. We just opened our uh, exhibit remembering World War II. Uh, later we'll have more on that para lang malaman ng ating mga kababayan na meron tayong ganyan na pwedeng puntahan, uh, daghin yung mga anak ninyo so they will learn. So, Guru Jobs, I was quite lucky. Uh, I don't know if that's the right term. Because my mom, she was oh, she was nine no, during liberation, almost 10 years old. So, maliit pa ako. She kept telling me stories. And may kasama pa kaming iyakan. Dahil nakaka, sobrang touching yung story how they evacuated Manila. My lola was almost dying. And then they moved back to Malolos. And ang dami, yung, yeah. yung ganun ba ng mga story? Ah? And sabi mo nga, sadly, totoo yan na maraming... Many of our veterans, you know, just clammed up after the war. And, but they themselves, they formed their own veterans groups. But hanggang dun lang, no? So it's really yeah. up to us now, the, maybe the older generation. <laughs> Ayoko sana sabihin yun. Pero parang nandun na tayo, di ba, Job? Na i-impart yeah. sa mga anak natin. Kasi sa totoo lang, let's not think that there's no interest. Kasi like uh, when we go, when yeah. I screen yung honor no, in schools, Grabe yung interest ng mga bata. Yeah. It's just that hindi natin nabibigay yung material yeah. sa kanila. Yeah. So it's really up to us parents, educators, and all no, the older generations to you know open the minds of our, our younger generations. Imbis na mag-mall, yeah. ayan, dalhin nyo sa, sa museums. Ito, sa aming yeah. uh, big exhibit. It will be up till December no, sa Fort Santiago. Uh, tayo yung dapat gumawa na ng aksyon. Kasi yung gobyerno, exactly. medyo matagal. No, jobs, ma... Tagalang yeah. antayan niyan bago yung magka-markers na yan. You, you, I saw a lot of pictures of, of Cebu there that you showed, yung may pillboxes. And dapat lahat yan may marker, eh, di ba? Yeah. Kung baga, in my mind kanina, kung nasa ibang bansa to, ako, ang ganda na yan, inayos yeah. na. Di ba, no? World War II trails na, may What? mga tours. Oo. Yeah. Complete with markers, explanations, a museum beside it. So nakakalungkot yeah. po, no? But uh, yun na nga, since we're in that Quagmire now, wala naman ibang magsusolve kundi tayo. So let's, ano, lalo na tayong medyo nasa World War II. Uh, let's help, uh, you know, teach our children, our nephews, yeah. our nieces, whoever, no, about the war. Kasi kung mag-escape pa sa generation natin, paano na? Who will tell of, you know, the stories of our fathers, yeah. our grandfathers, di ba? Makakalimutan na ng next generation. So... <laughs> yung, yung mga pillbox, 
Yung mga pillbox na sa likod ng isang city hall. Imagine that. Walang marker. the back marker. of a city. Walang marker. Oh it's at the back of a city hall. I'm sure may basura pa. <laughs> no, it's no, very no. clean. They put a park there, but it's not marked. But there's no so anything to say anything. Even in Leyte, yeah. my uh, cousin in Leyte was saying, ang daming pillbox, naglalaro daw sila doon sa may bundok. Siguro doon yeah. sa may dulag or palobanda, no? And we, we, were, we were there, diba? Jobs last 2019. Yeah. Sabi niya, ang dami nung bata daw siya. This was like maybe in the early 70s. But yeah, now when he God. came back, he's in the States. Wala na daw siyang makita ni isa. So yeah. what? Demolished? Kinanggal? Demolished, yeah. My gosh, diba? And, and, uh, nakakalungkot kasi, yun nga, kung sa ibang lugar ito, na-preserve na talaga. Hi! Yeah. <laughs> Very long litany yan of woes. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to our other questions. Jo- ano, ah, Jos, maraming question para sa iyo. Alright. From Ambassador Virgilio Reyes again. Was there a place where Americans were rounded up and held, uh, interned? as in the Santo Tomas in Manila were there were, were such a place uh, were there were there such a place in Cebu yeah initially the americans were brought to here in in the Cebu provincial jail Mose Subo where i am right now i'm at the curatorial office of the museum uh, this was an area where the americans were brought the british were brought at the UP junior college but around december they were all moved to USDIC They all brought to Manila. Uh, so they were incarcerated temporarily for six months here. But they were over, eventually shipped to Manila. Mm-hmm. All the foreigners, all the all the allied, uh, you know, the, the uh, nationals from allied countries, uh, enemy countries were brought to Santo Tomas. To Santo Tomas. All right. So that answers the question of Ambassador Reyes. Uh, yung kanina, you showed Jobbers yung naging internment camp for the Japanese. So this was before yeah. Cebu fell to the Japanese. no? And then, am I yeah. right? Naging, doon naman na naging prisoner of war naman ng, ja- ng mga Japanese. So guerrillas, suspected guerrillas. And ah, no, it's different. It's a different school. Early on? No, it's a different school. It's, it's near the, it's in the south. The other uh-huh. one that became the concentration camp for the guerrillas uh, they, they, where they were tortured and in prison is right here at the center of the of the city i mean at the near university of san carlos cebu normal university a cebu normal uh, that's uh, the uh, yeah. Right. yeah the sad thing is the whole evidence was painted over by by a university president there were, people were marking you know cajon yes, uh, yes. Cajon. there were so many marks like that on the walls but if you strip is strip the if you strip the paint you can still see i think underneath the all the markers of those prisoners who were who were down there so sad no? was there an outcry well, uh, when that happened from the yeah, yeah. cebu advocates for heritage well i didn't know mga tao eh. but ah. they saved one area one, one very small well the, the curator there was really uh, really adamant to have it saved that wala Sayang. yeah so no so Sayang. history deleted by uh, Paintbrush. Hi, yeah. hi, hi. Ito pa. May mga comments. Gaganda ng mga comments. At ito pala, from Dan Hardiman, my good friend. Uh, Dr. Bersales, any recommended readings on the Camotes Islands hostilities? Well, uh, the, the hostility, the, the massacres, atrocities, no one has written about them. They, they are in the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration. Oh. They are there. You can find the records. The photos I got are from the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration. So these are American CIC reports. They, they, Wonderful. When they got their materials afterwards. Oh. Your yeah, photos and your videos archives. are excellent. Grabe. Sarap manood dahil ang ganda ng ano, visual oh, aids. <laughs> from Leslie Murray, Tita Leslie of fame. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I learned a lot. Thank um, you. From Richard Laroya, Daghan Salamat, Dr. Bersales. Okay. Uh, from Professor Jose, Dr. Jose. Rico. Rico, Jobber, uh, congrats, Jobbers, for a job well done. One question. What happened to Admiral Fukudome? Well, you said it earlier, but you can still expound on it. I think Rico knows that, that the Fukudome was frozen. No, He was never given any command. He was, he was given an office, I think, in Tokyo. Uh-huh. He survived the war. Mm. It does job. In 1974, yata siya namatay. Oh. And, or, yeah. 
or 1964, but he, he Relegated to a desk job, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My friend Don Fernandez from the Wartime Heritage Guild, mga reenactor friends natin, says, listening while imbibing beers. <laughs> Masarap nga naman to. <laughs> from Sita Maramba, our friend from uh, UK, Daghang Salamat, Dr. Bersales. Okay. From Zell Aliego, my Lolo is one of the guerrillas from Tuburan? Yeah, I know Zell, um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Galeng. So never, never met him, but I know him on Facebook. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Tuburan uh, is from, famous from for Vanessa producing. Colmenares. I see. From Vanette Colmenares. Benton and Cushing were the two leaders in Cebu, right? Where can you find info on their logistics during those times? Logistics? Uh, uh, what do you mean by logistics? Um, Maybe uh, the they, Ivao na lang, no? Archives? Yeah, there, there's data on their ranks and all that. But in terms of logistics, they relied on the 103,000 volunteer guards, 13 to 16-year-old. Wow young people who brought food for them and carried all the mail for them who were never recognized by the United States because they could oh. not be on the roster of veterans. Oh, you have 9,000 veterans recognized in area command. But the people who cooked food for them, who brought camote, brought letters, right. who carried right. all the bullets for the guerrillas, all the boxes when they, when they were taken out of the submarines, were volunteer guards, 13 to 17 years old. They could not qualify as guerrillas, because they were built underage. They were never recognized. So that's, that's sad. Mm -hmm. Very sad. No? Anyway, um, speaking of you, a lot of our women at the time who served, they never, you know, they never uh, expected any, and also any recognition. May nakausap ako na matandang veterana, no? sabi niya, Eh, kasi ako naman ay eh, nagluluto lamang, iha. Sabi yeah. ko, Lola, hindi po lamang yun. <laughs> yung gerila, pag uwi, pagod. Kung walang maglulutos yeah. para sa nila, di ba? So, you see, I think it's yeah. partly, um, hindi sila na-recognize because they they just thought they were just doing their part, no? How Actually, yeah. that's very heroic of many of our ano, veterans. There's another one here from Zell Aliego again. One of my lolo, Judge Alpuerto, was also arrested in Dumanhug and refused to yeah. join Japanese forces and later on he was tortured in front of the people publicly. Sakatan yes, there is a report. There, there's, okay. oh, there's no Filipino family. There's not one Filipino family who was spared you know, any the death yeah. of a loved one or any form of hardship or sufferings. Ito, from Professor Mel Silvestre from UP. Hi, Mel. Thanks yeah. for watching. Had the Cebu guerrillas been recognized and supported earlier, do you think Japanese reprisals against Cebuanos could have been reduced or even prevented, Dr. Bersales? Ulitin ko, ah. Had the Cebu guerrillas been recognized and supported earlier, do you think Japanese reprisals against Cebuanos could have been reduced or even prevented? You have by, to understand by the West name. Pasaburo to, or MacArthur? Yeah, you have you have to understand the dynamics of the of what happened in the war. Atrocities happen immediately after a guerrilla attack. So it's not the other way around that if you have guerrillas, the Japanese will be afraid. Rather, the Japanese were already brutal to start with. And every time you a, a, a convoy of Japanese in Naga was they were on the Philippine Railway Company train, it was ambushed. And the reprisal was immediate. People in Naga right. suffered. Manila and the town. So you have to understand the dynamics of, 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 of the, the, you know, the, the, the concept of the Japanese was that you people who were the event happened should have prevented it from happening. You know? And so therefore right. you should suffer as a result of what, of that mass, of that ambush. Americans did, don't have that kind of concept. It's, I think, in the samurai culture of the Japanese. Now, if, if somebody gets killed on that street, you who live on that street, are supposed to be responsible for his security. Therefore, mm -hmm. you should pay for, for that. And they announced that. They had all kinds of announcements. So it's it's rather the Japanese cre had more atrocities. The more the guerrillas attacked them, the more the atrocities happened. Right. So it's 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 it, that's the kind of dynamics we have to understand. 
Yeah. And yung tama ko nga, it's a summary. It's the template, eh, wherever they go, eh. Here, Manila, Cebu, Cagayan, same. Same yung kanilang, meron yeah. silang zona, no? That they round up the males, yeah. oh, and they oh. kill them. Yeah. Kompleto, eh. It's the same. So, talagang nasa, nasa kanilang code, no? To, to yeah. be brutal, especially when there's a guerrilla, ano? And the price, the reprisal is always more brutal every That's time. why when MacArthur took over in Japan, he immediately stopped the whole concept of the samurai code. No, it was mm-hmm. banned. The samurai societies were banned. The the concept, the all these clans were disbanded. Mm-hmm. No, they were right. automatically well right from the mage period. They were already disbanded, but they continued into the military. I mean, the samurai was disbanded uh, when the Mage Restoration yes. happened, but they entered into the military. Yes, so it, yes. it took MacArthur and the Constitution to stop it. You know? mm-hmm. So now that Japanese do not want to go to war, no, mm-hmm. no matter how much the, 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 the conservative liberal democratic party wants to change the Constitution so that they will no longer have a self-defense force, but they will really have an armed forces. It won't pass the Japanese. Because mm-hmm. you have also to understand that the Japanese, ordinary Japanese, never really liked to go to war. It was the militarists in Japan. Right. And so so they too suffered. I mean, I'm not justifying for the Japanese, but many Japanese suffered, the communist Japanese, the, the Catholic Japanese. Yes. They suffered in Japan for resisting the imperialists, the, the, the right. uh, militarists. Right. Yung, yung samurai ano na yan, eh, no? Bushido and samurai yeah. code. Yeah. Uh, there's one more comment here. Cushing was pressured by the Japanese pursuit operations. That's why he was forced to release his prisoners. Yeah. Yeah. So, exactly. See, Cushing was demoted. What was his rank hmm. before he was demoted? He was a colonel. Colonel. So yeah, he was demoted by I, I, I think major or he was demoted by so many ranks. Oh. And, and then it was restored of- after. Right? Speaking of Cushing friend, was there like a... Diba Cushing was a miner also, was he? Yeah, mining engineer. He had a brother in Luzon who was also yeah. a guerrilla. Also but Cushing, was killed diba? earlier. Narito nga ako dyan dati. Right. William Cushing, but, I think. Diba si Fertig then, mining engineer. Yes. Am I right? Yeah, also. yeah. Yeah, I think that's where they were. The rivalry rivalry there is... <laughs> they were both looking rivalry. for gold. <laughs> 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 Baka so, baka nga, it's so weird of, so weird of Fertig, you know, not to uh, endorse Cushing and the Cebu area command to MacArthur, no? Kung baka hindi mo naman na teritoryo yun, bakit, di ba? So weird of Fertig. But you know, Fertig was, was, was the first to be recognized. The, the, this is the 10th military uh, kuma- district. Uh, yes. district was immediately recognized. So, mm-hmm. meron dyan siyang, meron siyang powerful na no, connection with MacArthur. Right, right, right. Fertig was also connected. very, yeah, yeah. Fertig was also a very strange personality, right? He he promoted himself. He made himself general. Mm-hmm. Uh, even mm-hmm. if he was only recognized as a colonel. I mean, that's what I know. Right. Then, so, oh. so all the... <laughs> May mga problema sila, no? Speaking May of... May mga ego. Friend, you mentioned yeah. earlier that uh, the niece of uh, Fenton was uh, writing a book about him, right? I met her. Grand niece? Great grand niece. Uh, actually, I, I don't know if we're niece? talking of the yeah. same person, no? But... Yeah. In 2018, when I was in the San Francisco World War II lecture by uh, seminar by uh, Bataan Legacy, si Ate Cecilia mm. Gerlan. So I spoke there about Jose Abad Santos. A co-speaker of mine talked about Fenton. Uh-huh. E, in the book, medyo hagiography talaga. Talagang wow, ito ba talaga? So I had to consult a lot of historian friends kung totoo ba to. And, and if I'm not mistaken, if I remember right, she was not the, the grand niece or but her mom. Niece, her mom. Her mom. Was the sister. Parang, was the sister. Napang asawa ni, o oh, ba, ng asawa ni Fenton? Something like that. Related to the wife of Fenton. Kaya medyo, For, I have to go back to my notes. Pero, parang ganyan. So, sa pagkakaalam ko, <laughs> mas, mas malapit pa sa niece. But it was really a geography. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-huh. She was looking for material and I told her, she emailed me, I told her that you, all you get is what's written on the internet and in Tabunan because uh, he died during the war. So Right. Oh. Yeah. The rest would be her geography. That's right. Then. It's myth-making. Oh, oh. Na lang. 
<laughs> and parang we, we made, she made it sound like you know Fenton was really a hero and all and isa pa so we were given like 20 minutes each no nako nag isang oras yata siya <laughs> Eh mga tao parang uneasy na parang ganyan. And That's we had to fantastic. ask si Dr. Jose and my good friend Peter Parsons to, to, to give me more about Fenton kasi nga parang super hagiography. <laughs> anyway, she might be, a lot more she might be watching here. now. Just, oh, nga baka nanonood. <laughs> a lot more que- uh, comments here, ha, jobs from uh, Dr. Jose Sorico. The documentary on the Koga incident was coupled with a portion on the Hunters ROTC guerrillas. Ah, yes, yes, yes. It was my History ah, Channel okay. Asian branch. Right, right. This ah, is History the Channel, yes. I watched. Oh, oh. Yeah, they called me up and asked for eh, Colonel eh, Segura and I directed ta- them. Pa- parang two-part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Parang two-part series yung ano na yun. I remember. And then another comment from Zell. At Lego, many guerrilla leaders were not even recognized in history, just like my Lolo and his one sibling is a uniform military part of the armed forces. My guerrilla Lolo is a public teacher, and as public teachers, they were considered as one of the leaders of the resistance. Well, that's true, marami talaga hindi na, hindi na, ano, hindi na recognize. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ito, from Theodore Vargas, sir, before Cebu fell, is it true that Cebu held a large supply of foods? Yeah, <laughs> the Doña Neat Nati of the of the Compania Maritima, the Fernandez brothers, uh, the Fernandez uh, the De La Rama lines was commandeered. No, the two boats, two ships, steamships. Hey. One was the Doña Neat, he was commandeered and brought to Australia and fulfilled filled with a lot of food for Bataan. But when it arrived around March. Wala na, blockade na ang Japan. Nag-see blockade na ang Japanese. They could not go proceed to Bataan. So they they ducked in Cebu and unloaded so many canned goods and food. In fact, when the Japanese arrived on April 10, they still hadn't finished, I think, unloading or just barely finished. And the Japanese were speeding towards Tanyon Strait. And the Doña Rati moved south also towards Bohol, avoiding by just a few minutes, a few hours, the arrival of the of the Japanese. The Donia Nati, by the way, survived the war only to be scuttled in the 60s. You know, it would have been beautiful to save it for a war museum no? because it, yeah. it saved Cebu. It, it gave Cebu a lot of food. Also the Japanese. Because yeah. when the oh, Japanese oh. invaded, they looked for the food. They went oh. up north. There was there were so many camps where the food was kept up here in the uplands. And they, they were able to see so many corned beef. And and yeah, powdered eggs, or whatever. And so the Japanese ate a lot of that corned beef. Oh, they should thank the Donia Nati for that. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the Donia Nati got the food from Manila? Australia. Ah, Australia. From Australia. Oh, I see. Oh, wow. Loaded from Australia. Oh. And brought to here for Bataan, but it could not reach Bataan. So it Nina. stayed yes. in Cebu. Yeah. There were That's some shipments which arrived in Bataan earlier on from Iloilo, yeah. from Ganyan, but the Doña Nati hindi na umabot. But amazing ang Doña Nati, no? Cebu was, all, the seas were already mined. It reached Cebu and went back to Australia. Was <laughs> did never hit any land mine. I mean, sea mine. It was alone. Uh, uh-huh. No escort. Walang escort. It, wow. Walang escort. Maybe the spirit of Doña Nati was with <laughs> With the the Fernandez, yeah, yeah, the 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 mother of Jobo Fernandez, I think. Not even that, yeah. Ah, yun yung ano full name, no? All right, friend. You talked about General Shinoeth kanina. So in my book, yeah. I mentioned a lot about him because he was kind of my hero, also, no? Because he he made sure that Abad Santos was safe. As in, yeah. kahit na ang kulit-kulit at hinatawagan niya si Abad Santos the Japanese yeah. are landing. Get out, go. get out now. Yeah. Get out, yes. And imagine, no, um, really, sabi ko nga, isa siya sa mga heroes ko dahil, no, he really had yeah. the heart. And um, sa, sa kinamalasang palad, what happened was, si Valeriano went the wrong way. Colonel Valeriano yeah. was his escort. Immediately. He was PC. Oo. Yeah, immediately turned. He was anti-American daw eh. Valeriano was anti-American before the war. Before I'm a pro-independence, the... anti-American. So pro-independence, anti-American. Oh. Captain Valeriano, aide de camp ni Justice Abad Santos. Right. I mean, he probably had a, 
an experience with ano uh, with you know local americas these things change you eh, kung kung naka experience ka with an american na na bully ka or whatever so he was an anti-american to start with i see so when the japanese arrived oh, welcome automatic uh-huh. pinatay immediately Diba? By, uh, siya eh, but he was killed yeah. in Negros or Negros. I saw your kanina one of your I'm gonna ask you about it one of the the slides you showed the Visayan Shimbun Shimbun yeah it says yeah, there, there the first there issue was a, yon, yeah that kern- yeah ah. Uy, the naman first issue jobs. Oh, oh. yeah yeah I, I can send you a copy oh, that was the first kirine, issue <laughs> Ah, so, sayon, no? Colonel Valeriano and three other together players. with the son of Sergio Osmeña, Jose Pepe Osmeña. Oh. They were sent by the Japanese to ask the American commander, the Yusufe there, to surrender. And the Yusufe said, "You give us time." When they were on the shores now, on the beach, to ride the boat, they were killed by the locals, by guerrillas. April. Because thinking that 16. they were pro Japanese. Yes, they were seen as pro Japanese. Yes. They were also there at the behest of the Japanese Imperial Japanese administration. Oh. They were sent there to ask Negros to surrender. I see. So kasalanan nila. Ayun. <laughs> no offense to the family, but even serious men, yeah, oh, oh. half, I mean, his children were either pro-Japanese, or I mean, collaborators, and the others were, uh, one had his head beheaded for refusing to become governor of Cebu, Dr. Emilio oh. Osmenia. Yeah. Well, the beheaded brother beheaded by the Japanese. Beheaded by the Japanese around May, around the, the, early in the in the invasion, he was offered the governorship to embarrass Sergio oh. Osmeña, the father, who was in exile oh. uh, on exile in Spain. Oh. I mean, in America, and he refused. So he was brought to his property in Lugo, the, the hacienda Osmeña. And they say he's, he was beheaded, and his body was never found. This is the father of Senator oh. John Osmenia. Ah, I see. Oh, okay. You know, I have a... Uh, yeah, isa yan sa ikotatanong ko sa'yo eh, the Osmenia families, what was their uh, ordeal or, you know, what was their status during the war. And alam natin, yung isang anak, di ba, was uh, an economic collaborator. In fact, I have very yeah. deep respect for President Osmenia because after the war, di ba, the Americans prodded him to do the people's Uh, court and all of that court, to yeah. to you know um to try, them, the to, collaborators, to try the yeah. collaborators whatever and he knew that his son was going to get tried diba pero he still yeah. went on with it yeah. so that's one of um, my uh, admirations uh, uh, kay senator eh, kay president Osmeña what yung kanina kwento man na so his son how about mrs Osmeña kasi diba si uh, Osmeña went to Australia na and then to the US with Quezon Where was Mrs. Osmeña at the time? He was time? with uh, he was with the, he was with Sergio Osmeña. They brought their fam- their wives there. Ah. If I, if I remember correctly, yeah. Oh, I see. So Limha, the second wife was with with him in uh, the United States. Ah, second wife pala yun. Kaya pala she was a bit. Well, the first wife died. The, the first, first wife, wife came from a very rich Chinese family, financed his political career, but he died in childbirth. Oh. Delivering the uh, 13th or 10th child. Oh, wow. Ang dami pa rin yung anak. <laughs> 16, I think, or 14. I'm not so familiar. Oh, wow. Marami. Ang dami pa rin yung anak, ano? Wow. Nagkalat pa ng lahi si President Osmeña. <laughs> yeah, and then anyway. if you have that many children, you'd have, you know, they, they grew up very differently in different circumstances. So few became collaborators. The others became steadfast you know, right. with the father very loyal to the father oh hirap ano the, the, the what, who yeah. who was that son who was uh, tried as an economic collaborator because he is in the his intent? namesake his namesake Sergio Osmeña Osmeña Jr. Oh, who right. ran for president against uh, against Marcos in 1969 that's the oh. same Sergio oh yan pala Osmeña. yon oh. yeah. was he ever he wrote a, no? he was he wrote a ba? book Uh-oh. No, he, uh, well, everyone was pardoned. So, na, 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 ano siya. But he was put to prison. And uh, he wrote a book, Dear Dad. I mean, it, it was never published. But there he explains, he addresses Don Serio, why he did it. And why it's mm-hmm. not collaboration. Mm-hmm. No? Yeah. Wow, so maganda yun na, hindi published. 
Speaking it's of books, zero. Mm. Sayang ano? Speaking of books, jobs. Where can may mga tatanong? Where can we find yung books daw na pinakita mo kanina? Kasi these are nowhere oh, okay. to be found mm. in national bookstore and etc. etc. Yeah. How can we Tabuna, get? Well, Tabunan has been updated. There's it's a bigger book now. The Tabunan originally of of Colonel Segura has been well enlarged and with annotations, no by. Dr. Erlinda Alburo of the Cebuano Study Center. So there are explanations of places, of events that that if you read this one, kasi, you would not understand because some of the places are no longer there. So there's annotations below. Excuse me, like footnotes explaining what, what what's going on or corrections. It's published by Ramon Amoitis Foundation and it can be, uh, you can buy it at Casa Gorondo Museum here in Cebu. That's the problem. You can only buy that in Cebu. And uh, the Koga papers is gone and they've they, they run out of copies. This there's not been produced. But a section of this one can be, I mean, this one can be found inside a section of, 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 of Tabunan. It's, yeah, it's it's just uh, uh. some more details. The War in Cebu can be ordered at the University of San Carlos Press, the big book. Yeah. Ayun. So far. This one under the Southern All Cross. Right. This is the one of the American division which talks of their many exploits all over leapfrogging from island to island. The final chapter is about Cebu because that's that's mm-hmm. when they, they, they stop uh, under the Southern Cross. You have to order this in the United States so those in the United States can buy easily. But or Otherwise, you go to the National Library of the Philippines. You can access this book then. And your book, someone's, ask, memoir, someone's asking where they can buy your book also. <laughs> I saw <laughs> earlier. Just message our page. <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, I'll uh, probably call uh, USC Press so that, you know, yeah. we can order some of the Warren's book. It's a very good book. I have one, pero yun lang, uh-huh. the only copy I have. There's also a book on so, the atrocities so of the Kapitai. Nice if we can also, yeah. you know, make the Manila and Marami interesting. Yeah. In Cebu? Atrocities yeah, there's there a in book, Cebu? Um, the Kapitai on the atrocities. It's also published by USC Press. It can be ordered also. Oh, wow. And then uh, oh. by Memories so, of okay. War. Also. We need to get that here. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I have that book. I think I bought it from an NHCP thing, eh. If I remember right, baka. Baka nag, I don't know. Baka na dito lang ako. <laughs> oh, we we brought we brought some anyway, books during that conference. Other yeah, yeah ah, I think so. Yes. Yeah. And your book about Babcock. Babcock is a limited edition. I think only three hundred were printed because it's very thick. Eight hundred oh, pages. Oh, it's beautiful. Or six hundred pages. Oh, oh. Yeah. Y- yun yung kayo ni Sir Rolly, de ba? You co-wrote yeah. with Sir Rolly Borenaga. So, yeah. But you should print more. Oh, oh, yeah, but it's anyway. very expensive. Go six hundred pages. <laughs> oh, pero maganda eh. Another yeah. comment from Vanette Colmenares. Where is this story about Penton? Ah, the book I was telling you about Kanina. Would love to know more about him. The Japanese authorities had the price on Penton's head about ten thousand pesos at that time in nineteen forties. Ayan ngayon sa mo John. Some people were saying that he was paid the Japanese to do so. Okay. Uh, a comment from Tita Leslie Murray. Tita Leslie is a survivor of STIC, Santo Tomas. Ito na nga. Oh. As a survivor of Santo Tomas internment camp, I would welcome more interest of Filipinos in World War II. I am a trustee of the Filipino American Memorial Endowment, or FAME, and one of, and one of the dying generations. We need more history yeah. of all eras in our schools. Yeah. I how true. I agree. Agreed. Yeah. Super. Uh, congrats- from Tony Fredo, congratulations, Dr. Bersales. Dami na congratulate from Andre. Thank you. <laughs> Ayun, yung about the logistics, thanks for your answer now. I, I will email you what I mean on this. Thanks. Great job. Si Vanette. I think Vanette is from Cebu, no? She's in New York. Uh, okay. Another- Vanette is in New York. Ah, in She's New based York. in New York. Oh, why? Yeah. Wow, talagang we're all over. Okay. Ambassador Virgilio Reyes has another comment or question. On the Japanese attitude that those who live in the neighborhood where killing happens are responsible, then the dropping of the two atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki are acceptable. Nako, this coming week, for sure. 
Facebook will be flooded with kawawa naman ng Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Kasi next week is August ano na, di ba? So, yeah, yan August, naman sila. But six. people fail to realize na kawawa din tayo dito at mas marami pa doon ang namatay dito. Di ba? <laughs> but yeah. Filipinos know about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, no, Jobs? Yun yung masakit doon eh. Alam yeah, nila, I've... but what happened here in our country? Ha? Nakangama right. lang. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, another sad. comment from Vanette. The dynamics you said about the ruthless Japanese is so spot on. Yeah. No wonder the fear. Ay, that's true, di ba? In the, yung, ano, yung, the, the posters that they paskil in public places, yeah, di ba? Yeah. Number one or number two yun. Yeah. Di ba? Kaya naman, the Americans never na did that, you know? Right. The Americans, when they invaded, they never did that. They never put true, out true. signs, no, like that. So it, it depends on the mentality, you know? Oh, of the invaders. Fear and no, yun yung ano nila, yun yung hawak yeah. nila sa tao doon eh. Yeah. Uh, from Zel Alego, sir, Dr. Jobs, did you get information that my lolo said that many of the Japanese forces were killed in Tuburan? Uh, well, many of the Japanese were killed in the north. In the north. So that's their last. That was their last Ayun, stand. They wanted. They wanted to jo- to go to Manila. There were no more ships, so they were all waiting there in the north, a hungry. They even killed their own children. There is a there is a court martial case in Japan of a general oh. who ordered children below the age of 13, Japanese or Filipino Japanese children, because there are many Japanese civilians married uh, Cebuanas, and, and, and those who came from Palau. A lot of Japanese came, came from Palau, were brought here in Cebu, and they had children. Anyone from 13 and below were to be killed because they were just, you know, useless because they're going to eat food and all that, but they can't serve in the war. Might as well kill them because they all cry at night when there's no food. Might as well kill them. And so many of these children, Japanese children, were killed somewhere in Car- Carmen up north while the Japanese were retreating. It's a famous court martial case in Japan filed by the United States government. The, yeah. the the children were killed because they were just a burden, or was there they were just a burden? Because they, they were just a burden. A burden. Yeah, oh, they're, they're burdened there. Some, oh, may Nobody mga accounts are. kasi di ba of cannibalism when you know they go really yeah. hungry. Wala na mga ganon. Wala, Wala na mga ganon, uh, but Wala they were naman. killed because they were noisy and they were a burden. Uh huh. And um, Suguro, before we end jobs, sorry, ah, overtime mm. na tayo. Sabi okay. ko sa'yo, oh, yeah, oh, ang daming questions eh. <laughs> it's okay. Yes, Very yes. interesting topic. You know, I'm really happy that we're doing this local war histories because, ayun nga, much light has, has been, uh, you know, has been uh, given on Bataan, Corregidor, you know, in Manila. But the Filipinos in general know very little of what happened in our provinces. And I, as I said earlier, uh, our provinces took on their share of the uh, you know hardships of war, right? Yeah. So it's really good that uh, a lot of people are watching us now and malaman nila what happened in the provinces, no? So, yeah, yeah before we go pala, meron pala akong ako, uh, any move by Cebuano Study Center or ano, to, to really let the people know, not just the Filipinos, but the world know that you know, the, the Cebuanos uh, sacrificed a lot so that these Koga papers will be sent to MacArthur and thus, hence, it, it ended the war faster, diba? Is there any, ano to that? Is there any move or have you heard of anything that the Cebuano Study Center would do or would like to do about this? Well, it probably has to be the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, rather by Cebuano uh, advocates here to recognize. Pero it's it's MacArthur's choice. Uh, Rico, Dr. Rico Jose would probably say it's, it was MacArthur's choice to avoid. I mean, understanding MacArthur, the megalomania, megalomania mm. MacArthur, he wouldn't give credit to anyone for the liberation of the United States, except to himself and his death handling of the war even if he was right. a very poor strategist according to military historians. No? So you'll, in that sense, we will keep on, ad, I mean, keep on 
pointing that out, but the historians in the United States have already said their piece. They're not going to turn around and re just and move that footnote one line into a you know an entire chapter on that incident. Morton is dead. All the authors that never touched the Koga papers, they're all dead. Uh, but so maybe one of these military historians can do a dissertation or thesis about it. But the U.S. National Archives did an article about the Koga papers, and oh. the ending of that of that article was that, and it, it's available online, is that it will be left for historians to judge the 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 effect, the the impact of the finding of the intelligence documents. It's in the you know one of the quarterly magazines of the National U.S. National Archives. Because even the archives recognize that all the documents are at the U.S. National Archives and Records Admin in in Virginia today, and it, it, they they do recognize. There's one that recognized that event. I know Jobs. Uh, we Phil War is quite close with the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Maybe write an article and I'll have it published there. <laughs> they have an eh, <laughs> online uh, journal. Sige jobs, sige write it. It's been, it it's, it been it's been published. Uh, Deviana wrote about it in the Pacific Journal. It's there's so many articles that have been published about it actually. Oh, kailangan so, kalubin natin uh, ano. Yeah. It will well the Japanese will probably should be the one to say na you know. There's a book also in Japanese by the way. I I've, I've been given a copy in Nippongo uh, in 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 Kata, Katakana Kanji uh, mix no uh, called the Otsu incident. Oh. It's a novel. It's a novel, but it's based on history, historical novel. So it's it's oh. very there's there are a lot of books about this oh. incident in Japan because oh. this was really an intelligence failure on the part of the Japanese. So yes. if the Japanese will write in English, one of the scholars, I'll be starting a visiting professorship in January. Maybe I'll get someone there oh. in, in at Osaka to write and say, why don't you write on your side and say that you know this was really your your worst blunder, so that the United States will recognize eventually. Right, right. Even the Japanese admit that this was their worst intelligence blunder. No. Right, and as you pointed out, no, hindi nila masyado ni revise yung <laughs> yeah. yung yung ano yung the show plan. Anyway, there's another yeah. no, eh, George, There's another um, the Mariana's turkey shoot, de ba? Yung intel non came yeah. from our coast watchers here, our guerrillas yeah. here. Also, no yeah. mention also. Na, there was supposed to be another There was also a map, I think, that was discovered also here in Cebu from oh. a Japanese ship. Uh, I know very little of that data, so I can't re report it. But I know two incidents happened here: the Koga incident and the discovery of a Japanese map of all the of all the the, the bases, the Japanese bases, and all that. That was supposed to be found here in Cebu earlier than Amazing. the Koga papers. Oh wow! Yeah. Amazing, ah. Cebu has a very deep ano, ano, World War II history. So, dapat talaga malaman ng buong kapilipinuhan kung anong nangyari sa Cebu and the other, our other provinces. Alright, so, it's getting late. <laughs> Sabi ko po yeah, kay Dr. Versalles, mga hanggang 9.30 lang tayo. <laughs> Super <laughs> overtime na kasi ang daming questions and a lot of them are thanking you for that wonderful, very comprehensive um, discussion on war and resistance Thank in you. Cebu. And uh, many people learned a lot now. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Job. Thank you. It's an opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for the time also and for inviting me. Uh, and I hope to see you next week. You. I'll be there yeah, for let's the see each other here. assembly. Yeah. Sige, usap tayo. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, you. watching tonight. I know it's a Saturday, but thank you for choosing to be with us. Before we go, we just have some announcements. Uh, una una po yung nabanggit ko kanina na oh sorry our ano pala our um, schedule for next month for next month's webinar is episode 9 it will be about the catholic church and at the crossroads during world war 2 so maganda rin po tong topic na to dahil uh, we do not know um, a lot about how the catholic church here in the philippines responded uh, ano ba yung mga ginawa nila na action to to resist or or not to resist so this is a very exciting topic that will be for august uh, and then for september we will have richard foy from connecticut 
he will talk about his father, Ensign William Foy, who flew several uh, missions here and was shot down in Laguna and was saved by the guerrillas. No? So um, he was so touched by what he researched about his father's ordeal and his father's survival and uh, who helped his father that he named his book Foy and the Filipinos. So yun po yung uh, magiging September natin na webinar. And then um, for uh, the rest of you who want to know about the exhibit that will be uh, that is now currently happening <laughs> in Fort Santiago at the Old American Barracks. We opened it last week. Uh, we had, you know, a lot of uh, big, big time guests. No, the if you can show the picture, Jesso, of the ambassadors who opened the exhibit. Well, that's ambassador, the Australian and Mexican ambassadors reading our panels. No, so the exhibit was written and created by yours truly, <laughs> with rare pictures from Dr. Jose and my good friend Tony Ferredo. Ayan naman po, um, that's Mayor Honey Lacuna opening the, uh, cutting the ribbon with all the other ambassadors who were there from Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, US. And we even had the Russian ambassador there, Akagulat. So they seldom come. So we were really thrilled when they did, no? So this was during the opening. And that's the facade of the old American barracks. Instead of going to the malls or whatever, bring your children here, uh, your parents, and uh, learn uh, a lot more about the war. Um, it, it gives us a, a, an overview of what happened during the war, uh, like, and it can be a refresher course for those who are old timers or, or alam na yung gera, no? And of course, it means to educate the young ones. So in this picture, ayan yung aking good friend, Tony Ferredo, who lent us many of the pictures here in the exhibit. So hope you can visit. It will be up until December 31st. That's inside Fort Santiago at the old American barracks. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for watching. On behalf of the Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation and the Filipino-American Memorial Endowment, thank you for watching. Good night and have a blessed Sunday tomorrow. Thank you.